Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are here to discuss, to listen to about the point in time in which Homo sapiens has stopped being influenced uh, by his planet and is now influencing the geology of our world and, and this, the societal impact of that. I've uh, got two very distinguished speakers here to talk about that. We've got Dr. Sorry, Professor. Professor now, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Jan Zavic um, from Leicester University. And he's going to talk about, to begin with, about the rocks. How, we've been, uh, you know, how, how, is it, how is it going to the core, as it were? And we've got Christian, uh, who's written a book called uh, the, Anthrop the Anthropocene, gets right to the, to, to the, the point. Um, and you're interested more in the societal impact of, uh, of what's coming up. Um, so over to you. OK, thanks very much, Robin. And uh, uh, as Robin said, we'll, we'll start um, um, with the rocks, uh, which is, of course, you know, the earth um, up, up, up there. Uh, and the, the earth is, is very old. It's really very, very old. Um, four and a half thousand million years. Um, you know, and nobody, not even a geologist, can fit that amount of time and history and process and events into their heads. Uh, what you're looking at there is four and a half thousand million years, uh, carefully, neatly tabulated and ordered by due process of committee. Um, you know, so it's all there, you know, the, the Cambrian and the Carboniferous and the Jurassic and the Pleistocene and, and all of that. Uh, it's a way we can divide Earth history into dynasties that we can more or less use as a common language. Um, uh, and within that, you know, we're just at the very uh, top left-hand side of that. So that's where we are, and it's hierarchical. So we live in, in the Phanerozoic uh, Aeon, which started about half a billion years ago when cre creepy crawlies came around. Uh, within that, we're in the Cenozoic Era. That's when the dinosaurs um, uh, kicked the bucket at that time, and, and mammals, you know, took over 65 million years ago. Within that, we're in the Quaternary Period period of, of the, 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 the ice ages, north and south, the last two and a half million years. And within that, that is divided into two epochs, most of it the ice ages of the Pleistocene. Uh, you also have the Holocene, uh, which is the last um, interglacial. The Earth warmed up about 11 and a half thousand years ago. And geologists separated that off because it makes our landscape. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice handy unit to have, even though it's very short at 11,000 years. Of course, why we're here, the question is, have we moved into something completely different? You know, uh, have we not just changed history and, and, you know, politics and the environment and so on? Have we changed geology fundamentally? Um, and it's an idea that's been around for uh, really quite a long time. You know, if, if you look at, trace the early ancestors, if you like, of the idea, uh, then this man, uh, uh, Jules Leclerc, the uh, Comte de Buffon, you know, in 1778, wrote a book called uh, Les Epochs de la Nature, The Epochs of Nature. Uh, uh, within that, he had seven epochs. It was the first scientifically based Earth history. In total length of time, he, he said 75,000 years. And even that for him was scarily long. Mm -hmm. But he had his seventh um, epoch within that, um, Lorsque la puissance de l'homme a secondé seul de la nature, uh, when the power of man, of humans, assisted that of nature. Um, and, and the idea sort of came in and out of geology after that, mainly out, because geologists basically said nonsense. You know, as they realized the Earth was very big and very, very old and very powerful, and oceans opened and closed and mountain ranges um, um, grew up and were eroded down. You had enormous volcanic outbursts and, and meteorite strikes. How could humans do anything on that kind of scale? Uh, well, it became realized in the last couple of decades that humans, in fact, could do things on that scale. Uh, and the idea was really crystallized by, by this man, Paul Crutzen. Um, he's not a geologist, more sensible than that. He's an atmospheric chemist. Um, uh, and he won a, a Nobel Prize for his work on the ozone layer 
He also worked with the likes of Carl Sagan on, on nuclear winter ideas and so on. Uh, very one of the world's most respected scientists. Um, uh, um, and he, well, a meeting uh, about a little under 20 years ago, people were talking about the Holocene, and he said, stop. You know, we're not in the Holocene, we're in the Anthropocene. Uh, and um, he published the term to say that, you know, the Holocene had stopped. His hypothesis uh, and that the Anthropocene had started. Uh, and really, that's... Uh, scientists, geologists have been playing with the idea, working on that idea, uh, testing it out, really, ever since. Uh, and a, a, a few... The geologists were, were very late, as ever, very late to the party. Um, and they were reacting to events, and I was part of a, a group of the Geological Society of London. Just down the road, we had a meeting uh, in a room not quite as grand as this, but, but still pretty nice, uh, with free wine, I remember, uh, where uh, uh, we discussed this idea, that it, this name that was being used as if it was real, but was not real, not formal, not part of the geological timescale, not part of that list. Could it be formal? Could it be real? Uh, and our answer, cautiously, was, well, it might be. We we're very cautious about this. Um, the evidence seems to show that there's something real behind that. So, um, the, the last five or six years, I've been part of a group of scientists of, uh, looking at the evidence to see whether the Anthropocene could be geologically real and formally bureaucratically real as well, which is a much greater thing. In, in, in geology. So, uh, what is it? Where should it start? And people have suggested the Anthropocene might start anything from over 10,000 years ago uh, to still be in the future. This is the current um, uh, leader of the pack for the contenders. Um, the Great Acceleration, the post-war boom in everything, in oil, in, 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 in gas, in coal, in nuclear, in technology, uh, in agriculture, in, in biological effects. So, um, roughly mid-20th century. So, a number of us, you know, uh, were born before the Anthropocene started in, in that case. That is a formal definition. History, of course, goes on and is complicated. We have to find, you know, a, 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 a boundary. So what is the evidence? What is the rock evidence for the Anthropocene? Well, uh, minerals. Um, humans, we, without realizing it, we make all kinds of new minerals. Um, uh, we separate out metals. Uh, nature doesn't like doing that. Humans do that very, very well. So, for instance, we have collectively you know, separated out about 500 million tons of aluminium. Again, mostly since the mid-20th century. Uh, enough to coat the whole of the USA and a bit of Canada um, in aluminium foil. Um, you may or may not decide that's a good idea or not. Um, uh, uh, your ballpoint pen has probably a, a tip of tungsten carbide, another new mineral. And again, there are lots of these. We don't know how many. Thousands at least. You know, we are making a new mineral epoch, if not mineral era, in, in, in that. The total number of natural minerals is only just over 4,000, and most of those are vanishingly rare. Uh, other ones, mineraloids, plastic. These are the greenhouses of Almeria in Spain. Uh, this is what happens to them. <laughs> and they get scattered all around the world. Six billion tons about of plastics we've made, enough to coat the whole earth in cling film. Most of it not recycled. Minerals make rocks. Um, and this is, a, a, again, rock, of course. The, the rock of... All seasons, concrete, uh, that is about 500 billion tons, enough for a, a, a kilo every square kilometer, sorry, every square meter of the Earth's surface. Um, and it goes in, <laughs> we make lots of it. Bricks, a trillion bricks a year at the moment, um, uh, lots of that. And, and of course, rocks make strata. And we make, again, lots of strata. Uh, we make build up strata. We make negative strata, holes in the ground. Uh, we map, geologists map the strata, my colleagues at the British Geological Survey are making maps of human-made strata. That's London, that's not... Uh, we're probably on there somewhere. Uh, we go deeper into the ground by far than any animal. 
Um, I think the record is the Nile crocodile we worked out, about 12 meters when it <laughs> estivates. Uh, that is, that uh, gold mine there is over three kilometers underground uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, and these are boreholes, of course, which can go again many kilometers up to 10, I think 12 is, is the, the record, but commonly 7, 8, 9, 10 kilometers underground. Uh, this is, um, the, the little thing is a truck, there's a road, there's a crater. Beneath that crater, um, there was a nuclear bomb. And it made a bit of a mess. Um, it is the, we are the only biological organisms to make uh, um, uh, uh, igneous plutons underground. Um, uh, chemistry, um, geologists call it chemostratigraphy. Um, uh, and of course, you know, this is, you know, uh, and, and, and Robin and his colleagues have written much about this. We are changing Earth's chemistry. It is rather easy to change Earth's chem surface chemistry uh, because we have less atmosphere. This is a lovely uh, diagram drawing work of art by the artist Adam Neiman. That's all the air we have up there, the, 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 uh, all the, uh, the atmosphere we have. Uh, scarily, that little marble rolling about up there, that is all the water we have the f on Earth, all the oceans, the rivers, the lakes, uh, the ice caps, the groundwater. That's all we have. So it's easy to change its composition um, as we are doing. We know um, important things about past air, fossil air. There's fossil air there that's probably a few hundred thousand years old in, in that uh, chunk of ice pulled out from deep under Antarctica. Uh, and that is 400,000 years of carbon dioxide going up and down and up and down. And then finally, on the right-hand side there, going up well beyond anything in the last two million years, uh, at, at, at least. Uh, and what it's doing, um, and this is um, a little diagram, a very recent diagram, um, just published a couple of months ago. That red you see now, Antarctica, is a sign of water freshening because so much ice is melting. Uh, it's about somewhere between two and 400 um, uh, billion tons of ice is melting every year. That's about 50 tons each for each of us every year. Uh, and sea level is beginning, just beginning to creep up uh, because of that. Uh, another thing, we've altered carbon, there's nitrogen. Again, since, uh, since the mid 20th century, we have doubled the, si the amount of reactive nitrogen at the Earth's surface. Probably the biggest change to the nitrogen cycle, it has been said by a respected geochemist, for two and a half billion years, uh, which is quite something. And of course, a nuclear signal, um, environmentally trivial so far, but a wonderful marker. We're all, all of us, and everything on Earth, again since 1945, since um, Alma Gordo, um, have um, um, plutonium and cesium, uh, americium, you know, uh, on us, detectably on us and on the floor here, you know, on the, in this glass of water. <coughs> Fossils. Um, uh, well, um, here's a fossil. It's a fossil, uh, a trail of some creepy crawler. It's about half a billion years old. Um, there's our equivalent, a footprint. Um, this is one of my favorite fossils. It's, it's a, a fossil wasp's nest uh, from the island of Tenerife. It's about a million years old. Uh, this is our equivalent. Uh, we're sitting in it at the moment. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and this is, of course, where we are. Um, uh, we're in a, it's a fossil, it's a trace fossil. It is wonderfully geological. It's made of rock, steel, and, and wood. All of it will fossilize, you know, given half a chance. Uh, and and the, another one, this is a trace fossil system called uh, Shanghai, which just goes on and on and on for thousands now of square kilometers. And of course, 3% uh, of the world's land surface is like this, is a very complicated trace fossil. Uh, and of course, we have our usual fossils as well. Uh, meet Jane. Jane is at Leicester University's uh, Tyrannosaurus, uh, uh, adolescent, teenage uh, Tyrannosaurus. Uh, and of course, we use other fossils uh, to give us a history of life on Earth. That is, again, you're looking, I apologize for the speed, at half a billion years of life's ups and downs, um, uh, radiations and extinction events when it goes down. There have been five big mass extinction events. Um, are we in another one at the moment? Well, we've had extinctions. There's a poor dodo, Dido Synaptus. What a name to hang on to a, a creature. <laughs> Insult to injury. Uh, that's a Yangtze dolphin, uh, photographed, probably now extinct. 
the, the Costa Rican golden toad, uh, discovered, uh, named 1964, extinct in the 1990s sometime. So, do we have another mass extinction event? Um, this is something that our, our, our colleague Tony Barnowski, the University of California, has been looking at with his colleagues. His answer um, is not yet. Uh, but there are many, many, many creatures on the edge. Um, between 20 and 50% of species in many groups are in, uh, endangered or critically endangered. Uh, so he said, give us another couple of hundred years of business as usual. We will have uh, the sixth major mass extinction event. So it's not for certain yet. And it can be put off. Um, but it's, it's heading in that direction. This is something that has happened. This is something quite new in Earth history. Um, the invaders, uh, rabbits, my cat, controlling the ecology, meet Mimi, uh, she, uh, she ru runs our back garden with an iron paw. Um, uh, uh, rats, of course, everywhere around the earth. Uh, the, uh, this is the, uh, the zebra mussel, uh, originally uh, from uh, a, a, a small part of Russia, uh, and now doing very, very well and it's taken over the United States of America, just about. Something the Politburo never managed to do in its time. Uh, and so we have carried, wittingly or unwittingly, uh, creatures uh, around from between every continent and every ocean on Earth. That is new. That level of invasion has not been seen for uh, the three plus billion years of life on Earth. Uh, and so in many parts of the world, Invasives outnumber native species and are numerically dominant. Uh, and of course, part of that is because of us. There are a lot of us. Uh, if you take land vertebrates, moderately to large sized land vertebrates, we make up a third now. Instead of 350 species, uh, with, um, you know, that is the, the, if you like, the long term baseline average uh, with matter and energy distributed between them. We're now down to 180 species. Uh, of those, we one make up one third. Uh, the creatures we keep to eat, the cows, the pigs, the, the sheep, the goats, uh, they make up most of the rest of the two thirds. Um, all the wild things, the, the, the rhinoceri, the, the cheetahs, the lions, make up less than 5%, probably less than 3%. So again, this is a quite novel departure. You know, um, you know, so it is quite something of a future fossil record we've got. And our machines, uh, what we are now calling our techno fossils, part of uh, the technosphere which we depend on, which surrounds us, which is all around us here, uh, are as an order of magnitude or two larger than that. So that, if you like, is a case for prosecution, the geological, you know, Anthropocene is rocks, uh, if, if you like. Um, and we still have the question. It is not yet formally decided. Um, you know, we as a group are meant to give our recommendations next year. It will be a tall order. There's a lot of complicated evidence out there. And we geologists are not used to working quickly. You know, you know, and, you know, unlike journalists who have to work quickly all the time, we're usually very slow about things. Uh, nonetheless, it, it's the idea is clearly out there. The Nobel laureates a couple of years ago in Stockholm used it you know, as a, a defining concept to try and understand what is happening to the world. Uh, Nature uh, did an editorial a couple of uh, years ago again, suggesting that it is useful to have this, again, to keep ourselves in a long-term perspective. Uh, so have we really broken through into something quite new in Earth history? So again, uh, it, it would be a wonderful question to discuss for the next uh, hour or so. So I'll leave you with an Anthropocene sunset with a jet contrail up there in, in the sky. So thank you for your attention to all this rock stuff. And I shall pass over to, to uh, Christian. Super. Thanks, Jan. Well, good evening and thanks, um, Jan, for this wonderful introduction to the Anthropocene, uh, paving the way into this new geological uh, epoch, um, and which really brings up a lot of um, very hard, but also wonderful questions for us. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I was kind of looking forward to touching that desk that normally uh, sits here. 
but I think um, it obviously found a better place to, to live. And uh, I think it's quite good, actually, because that desk kind of radiated an um, uh, atmosphere, a sort of uh, authoritative uh, atmosphere, whereas I think the Anthropocene is a very open concept that needs a lot of open debate and, and brings up so many open questions um, that really need us all to think about it uh, and not um, of course, in geology, there is an authoritative voice that will say yes and no, but then what do we do with it? So I want to continue where Jan um, kind of stopped, and this is a very personal interpretation of the Anthropocene, and I think we will have millions of personal interpretations of this phenomenon, and we need them. So here you have um, the geology, that Jan wonderfully described, uh, looks like very orderly, um, like uh, almost like skyscrapers or something, but the Anthropocene really is, is the rocks, of course, the long history of Earth, but it is human consciousness that comes into the game of Earth history. It's the number of humans rising or falling that affects it. It's this great acceleration made up of a lot of factors like um, technology, like energy use, like values in our societies um, that come in, like money flows, a lot of factors that come in and influence what ultimately then will become the Anthropocene, because it's an emerging phenomenon. It's not something that's kind of um, sitting there mono, monolithically um, like one of these fantastic rocks, but it's something evolving and emerging. So it's an, an open thing. I have tried to interpret this as a journalist. It was my experience as a reporter, uh, but increasingly I feel I'm approaching it just really as um, a citizen of planet planet Earth. Um, the book I've written um, has inspired in its German edition a couple of projects. Um, at the House of World Cultures in Berlin, um, running for the past three years, um, like an intellectual festival where we brought together uh, scientists from really different fields, like uh, geologists and psychologists, to examine how does the human psyche affect the geology of the future. And we played that out in different formats, including, as you can see here, the guy who is in a very funny uh, posture. Um, with form we had a naked man on stage during that festival. Uh, which was really interesting. He was a robot, um, an ape, um, and an artist at the same time trying to impersonate that. And a dog, I think. Um, and we have an exhibition ongoing. If you come to Munich um, at the German Technology Museum about the Anthropocene, you see Paul Grutzen here in the, uh, on the image and Achim Steiner, the head of the United Nations Environment Program, who opened the exhibition. So please, if you do come to Munich, uh, visit the exhibition. It is um, the first in the world to really try and explore the the phenomenon from, from many different angles. And this is one example of what is shown there. It's a, 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 a hypothetical fossil um, of the future, a piece of plastic fossil, perhaps, that uh, will be found by a young of the deep future. Now, I have come a lot of, um, uh, across a lot of um, critical questions about the Anthropocene, and I think that's good. It needs critical debate. It is an on the one hand, it is a, um, a scientific um, hypothesis, um, but then it has effects, it makes people think, it makes people, it provokes people. And people, for example, think it might be anthropocentric. People think it might become um, a vector of human entitlement. Um, like, now we are the masters of planet Earth, and we own it, and we can run it, and we can engineer it. Um, it's ours, um, is that perhaps the meaning? Or people um, say that it is too abstract a view. It's like, you know, it's not in Earth. It's like uh, so far away from, from it, in a, in a sense. Like the, the, the biggest picture you can take, far away from our lives. And then there is this idea that the Anthropocene is the sum of all environmental havoc. And if it was that, then really, perhaps society should try and fight it, because would we want to live in a nightmare for the next 10,000 years, if that is what the Anthropocene is? So my big question, which I try to explore is, is there something, a way towards a better geological record? Um, we will do, uh, we will create, um, f um, our um, footsteps will be there, but can we create more beautiful footsteps um, and leave behind more beautiful footsteps. Um, the Anthropocene idea thinks 
um, 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 helps us with that by redefining our sense of time because we live in a very short-term world with a very short-term economy where managers are valued by what they do for the next day or week um, and the nanosecond trading uh, we have is the symbol of today's economy. And then on the one on the other hand, we have the apocalyptic thinking in the environmental movement. So we are kind of bouncing between nanosecond trading and end of the world um, thinking. Now the Anthropocene creates something like a long now idea. It creates a deep future. This means it's a geological epoch. It puts us on the scale of Earth history. Other cultures like uh, Hindu culture already was able to think long term for a long time. Like one year for Brahma is three billion years on, on Earth. And Western culture is kind of catching up with that, developing now a more long term approach to our lives. And the Anthropocene is helping us with that, creating a sense of a beginning. Now, Jan wonderfully described the spread of cities. And if you look at the spread, the protected spread of cities, you will have cities in the future that are 1,000 kilometers long. Um, now, this was Paris here. Um, and the cities of the future in West, Af West Africa or along the Chinese coast might be 1,000 kilometers long. So what is in that for me as an Anthropocene message is that these cities will be nature. They will act like nature because they are the dominant phenomenon uh, around. So they will have to act like nature, or one could say they will have to think like a planet, as Marina Alberti has put it. Um, which means cities have to become something like ecosystems. Um, this is an impressive image, but not yet where I would like it to be. This is, I think, in Florida. And the green you see is golf, is golf courses. I'd love this to be bogs um, that capture the CO2 we produce. And I'd love cycling highways going through there. I'd love new wetlands being created there, um, wild spaces, open social spaces where kids can meet wildlife. So this is an idea for London. I don't know if you like it or not, but I think a strategy to reshape our cities in a sustainable way is important because the cities will be nature. Likewise with agriculture, we are used to extract our food from the soil. But in the future, the agricultural areas, already we have changed 75% of the planet's surface. So the agricultural areas, they are the new nature. So we have to run agriculture like a ecosystem that we can live from for a long time. You see burning rainforests here. That's where the soy gets grown that feeds the beef you eat, probably. So, and I eat. Um, so, um, this is a big call to develop a new kind of agriculture, not like this. This is where all the nitrogen goes um, that Jan spoke about. Uh, it's a pig farm in the US. Um, so, in the future, we should develop genetic highways, for example, that run through our cultural landscape. Um, and I think modern technology with GPS driven tractors uh, allows for that because they can go around that. Now, the technosphere um, needs to become part of the biosphere um, and become, in a way, compostable. Um, so today, it's kind of this Anthropocene thing that uh, the larger the pile of rubble you leave behind, the larger you are in the historical record. Perhaps we can become a little bit more invisible in the geological record, uh, like the negative strata you talked about, and perhaps that might be an Anthropocene signal to the future, not leaving behind plastic, um, but making the plastic so valuable that you don't want to throw it away or invent new types of plastic that will dissolve in the ocean within a short time without leaving um, toxic chemicals around. Um, the technosphere becoming part of the biosphere, I don't know if this is the right way. It's a military cow that's been developed in the United States. The company has just been bought by Google. Um, uh, so if you um, meet a cow like that out in the countryside, you know it's a, it's a Google cow. Um, but um, perhaps it will collect environmental data in the future and uh, be a good, good thing. Um, Another Anthropocene challenge is to um, develop a sharing economy. And I don't mean Uber, um, and I don't mean um, Airbnb. I mean that we have to start multiplying thinking 
that we have to multiply our lifestyle, Western lifestyle, by seven billion people. And is that the lifestyle that is kind of globalizable, if you want to call it like that? Um, the sharing economy means that um, we allow enough space for other people to develop their own lifestyles. Becoming energy smart is another Anthropocene challenge, um, with global warming now taking off. And efficiency can do only so and so much. Um, now, this sheep looks very interesting, and it's surely very efficient, as the company uh, claims. But I, I see this cliff behind there. Um, so, um, and if that stumbles, then that you know, will uh, be an interesting um, sequel to that uh, advertisement. So, um, I think even if you don't like wind farms and other forms of renewable energy, we've been ignorant about this question for so long that perhaps that's the price we have to pay um, to get out of fossil fuels. And um, the International Energy Agency has identified a, a gap of 100 billion US dollars annually on energy research. Um, now, this is a fusion reactor, for example, that could solve our energy uh, crises, but um, it costs money to do these things, and there is too little spent on, on energy research. Um, Anthropocene challenge um, number seven for me is to become more conscious about directed evolution, because we are not just diminishing biodiversity, we are also increasing it. And um, increasing it with amazing creatures uh, we live from, and we live with, um, and even synthetic creatures um, that still live in the laboratory, but might one day uh, be released. This is what Craig Venter has done. Um, his or her name is Cynthia. Um, it's a, um, a microbe that has been put together molecule by molecule in the lab. That just reflects the amazing power we have, and um, becoming more conscious about that power, I think, is really important. For me, the Anthropocene is not anthropocentric because it makes us aware how deeply rooted we are in the Earth system. In a way, it breaks up that long-held barrier between nature and culture. And nature becomes culture, in a sense, and thereby culture becomes nature in the Anthropocene. And that, ma that makes us feel, also through the crises we will go through and already go through, how deeply connected we are. So, the Anthropocene is a vector not to make us more um, centered on ourselves, but make us more open to um, connect with the other life forms we share um, this planet with. These are my two kids, and um, surely I'm trying to make sure that they connect with the oceans, for example, not only in the local shopping mall. Now, Anthropocene challenge number nine, and I have 12, I'm finishing soon, um, is um, to make our economy a subset of ecology. We act as if nature was something, the environment was something we can take in for free and put in our waste after we use things. Uh, that's the Holocene for me. And the Holocene for me is the era where we had all this for granted and where this big environment was around us, where we could extract things from and put our waste into. But this doesn't work anymore. Everything now comes back. And um, the environment, in a sense, becomes the environment. That's what we, what we shape. So is it really good that a living rainforest has no value in the books of the city or of the Frankfurt stock market. Zero, as long as it's living, providing us with pharmaceuticals, with um, fresh water and everything, it's, its value is zero. So I think we need to find ways, it's a very controversial subject, but find ways to factor um, the value of nature into our economy and realize that really what we call the economy is um, a part of ecology. So economists call nature an externality. That's really weird. I think for me these people live on a different planet. Now I call this a central bank and you all know this. I think this is a really important and we might face some situations with climate change where Kew Gardens is more important to us than a lot of the algorithmically produced money you have in Frankfurt or in the, in the city here. Uh, because there the seeds are kept that might nourish us in the future. Now this is a table at my home. I think an Anthropocene challenge is really that we link our lives to this big idea. The Anthropocene is not something that's you know, just 
somewhere in academia. It's something that we do every day. We are Anthropocene practitioners when we eat, when we decide whether to cycle or drive a car. And you can see I have this little planet in the back there. Uh, it's a talking planet, so if you put a pen to it, it will tell you something about the countries or the languages. And in the future, perhaps, there's a planet that will tell us what the food we eat does to itself. Um, and I think this linking of our lifestyles to the Anthropocene needs some more cultural practices. This is Bali, where people make offerings um, and um, to make sure that you know, everything's all right in balance with nature. Um, so when I came back, I, I started looking at my waste bin um, as a kind of offering I give to planet Earth every day. And I felt really bad. So I think we need kind of more new cultural practices that reflect that sort of thinking. And it's a call for action, the Anthropocene, um, and participate in uh, activities like the Climate March. Now, my vision for the Anthropocene would be um, that we, the internet grows far beyond what it's now. It's um, now becoming more of a commercial thing. And um, I think um, we should try and direct it towards an internet that's, we now talk about the internet of things, but what are these things? Are they fridges and cars and commercial products? Or are the things we want to have in our internet, the living beings we, we share planet Earth with? So you see here the net of, network of sensors, environmental sensors, already building up around the globe, I think that's fantastic. And perhaps in the future, the internet will become something that is like a planetary nervous system. And one thing I find really uh, important is that um, we take that what we call materialism more seriously. I think we need to become more materialistic because if we were materialistic, we wouldn't throw everything away. So this is an artwork um, that is um, in a wonderful gallery, uh, very close here in the October Gallery, uh, um, and it is made from uh, metal bottle caps. And it just shows what wonderful things you can do with material you consider to be worthless. So really become part of the, the material cycles. Um, Jan um, um, described is really important, and to, to feel that. Um, in an age where this plant will be composed, and it's a plant from the tropical rainforest, this, a, this plant will be composed of carbon atoms that have gone through your life. It's in the middle of the rainforest, but the atoms of carbon that you produce and I produce when we drive a car um, will make up that plant. And likewise, uh, the nature, uh, the stuff we put out into nature becomes nature. Um, this is a glass beach where uh, a dump was, where old glass bottles were put, and they've become this wonderful beach. So I think there's a positive aspect to that. Most importantly, I think the Anthropocene really needs to be something that is for everybody. And that's what I call the Anthropocene democracy, something where you start um, viewing the planet, planet's development from the point of view of the weakest. I think we do wonderful things. We build machines that can simulate the Big Bang. We can create flowers uh, on the level of nanometers or something that looks like flowers. And we can send astronauts in space um, who then are so happy to get a tomato sent up um, that they tweet back how wonderful it is to have this fresh tomato up in space. So if we can do all this, I think that we, we can go towards a better geological record. And, and we can all be part of this. So Jürgen Renn said the Anthropocene is a process that reflects about itself. And I can't say whether we will be really entering a fabulous Anthropocene, as this artist implies here, but I think it doesn't have to be just the sum of all environmental problems. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, well, I've got to congratulate both speakers, both for spoke less than I asked them to, which means I've got to speak more a bit, so I'm not so sure that was a good thing. Um, it was interesting that you had a picture there uh, of the Large Hadron Collider, which most people think is the, the greatest experiment on Earth, but really it's nothing compared to the experiment that we are now doing to our planet. That's the, really the great experiment uh, the, and all the different ways that you have described it, all the things that we're putting out there. Um, you've we were both definitive and provocative, and uh, I'm going to open the questions out in 10 minutes. But I've, I, I, there's one little 
Um, slightly trivial question that I want, I've put to both gentlemen. Um, when do we actually think the Anthropocene began? What is, has anybody got a favourite date and a favourite place that they would like to do it? Now, I, I, I say this because I'm a Glaswegian. Um, you might have spotted <laughs> that. And uh, I, I, I was born very near Glasgow Green. Um, and in the middle of Glasgow Green, there is a large boulder in which is inscribed, roughly speaking, it was around this spot that James Watt uh, while wandering through Glasgow Green, conceived of the idea of the secondary condenser for a steam engine. And I maintain that that's the spot where you can actually say that's where it all began because that triggered the Industrial Revolution. Now, that's my bid. Over to you. And you get your, se your shot in a second. <laughs> sure. And if anybody in the audience has got, hey, a favourite, shout them out. Yeah, it's a lovely idea. You know, right. And it, it, sure, you know, it, it clearly is one, one of the, you know, the, the great... Historical turning points, you know, where where the history of life went down, you know, a different trouser leg than the one it would have gone down <laughs> um, if if that hadn't happened. You know, the, the Earth would be different. You know, so uh, that certainly, if you look at it historically, then we look for these key moments. Um, in, in geologists, we we we're not quite as subtle as that. We look at rock, we look at strata, uh, and of course, part of what is we're dividing up the Anthropocene. We're not just dividing history. In, in fact, we're not primarily di dividing history, we're dividing rock strata. Uh, when we think about the Carboniferous and the Jurassic, it is the rocks which have within them all the evidence of everything that happened in that time. So in fact, we have a dual time scale. It's a parallel time scale of rock strata and of time, of normal time, but lots of it. Uh, so the way we typically divide time, and these are arbitrary divisions, arbitrary, but meant to capture the natural, if you like, dynasties of time. Um, so I think the one I would put in, uh, I'd like to go um, uh, well into the past, but in the future, as it were. Um, uh, the rocks I look at for a trade, you know, for my craft, uh, is rocks of, of, of mid Wales, very rainy, very wet, very green, um, lots of sheep. Um, beer, so-so, I'm afraid, uh, <laughs> in that. Um, where the rocks are about half a billion years old, 400, 500 million years old. And they represent a, a kind of sea floor which we don't really have on Earth today. It's a sea floor uh, which had little oxygen. It was more or less stagnant. Uh, so the strata piled up, the layers of mud piled up year by year by year. And they're a wonderful archive. If you compare that to modern sea floors, modern sea floors have creepy crawlies, lots of oxygen. And so they chewed through. We, it, it takes history and chews it up, literally. You know, so it, 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 it puts it you know, through, a, if, if you like, a food blender. <laughs> um, but there are one or two places on the sea floor where we go back into the Silurian and the Ordovician. And there's one of those off the coast of, of California, something called the Santa Barbara Basin. It's a little hole in the sea floor, and oxygen doesn't get in. So the layers of mud pile up one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. And they've been doing that for about 2,000 years. And you can put out, pull out fish scales from those layers and compare that with fisheries catches and things like that. Uh, one of the things we, do, we hope to do, you know, for the fun part of our formal thing, is to look, uh, get cores of, of those ancient but modern layers and look for that for the history of the Earth year by year, layer by year, uh, and to see when within that we, we can see layers, we can, we can say, ah, there, there is either plutonium or plastic, you know, or some kind of fish scale, which will tell us we've got a nice marker. We can follow around. So that would be my suggestion, uh, and it's something we, we, we have yet to see how it would work out. So that's a suggestion of where to look rather than... Yes, 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 yeah. We, okay. Right, I'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to ask Young something first. Can one put these things into a hotel room? Would that be possible? Of course. Yeah. Yes, so yes. How, how would it look like? Is it like a golden something or? A, well, um... it would be a core. It would be yeah. you know, the thing is you do. It's 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 layers of mud, and it's it's a, but I guess it's about the size of London. You know, this this hole in the sea floor. It's it's surrounded by walls on all sides, so oxygen doesn't get in, uh, and you simply to get to it, um, you 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 have to um, lower a big box. Box goes into the mud. If you're lucky, when you lift the box up, it has all the layers of mud. You can take that to a hotel room or somewhere oh, else okay. and pick 
the layers of mud apart. Yes. Well, because I would suggest that the hotel room, really, where Paul Crutzen had the suggested ah. the idea of the Anthropocene, right. would be a really good thing. Because yes. it's exactly what uh, Jürgen Renn said, that the Anthropocene is a process that becomes aware of itself and that reflects upon itself. And Paul Crutzen's idea, yeah. and it was also, of course, the word was already around. Eugene Sturmer had already used it. Yeah. But Paul Crutzen congenially um, kind of conceived it and, and used it there. And from there, it made its history. So that would be a good thing. To, to do perhaps, I mean, the glass beach, I don't know uh, how much. And if uh, people were taking minutes. You liked it? Hmm? If people were taking minutes at yeah. that meeting, mm -hmm. the, 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 you would have the first word, the Anthropocene, yes. actually down as a material record, geologist like material record. Okay, records. so we can nail down uh, the paper nail, yes, in the exactly, hotel. Yes. I don't know if the hotel yeah, manager yeah. Will, will like that. <laughs> what, what date was um, that? Sorry. I, I, date that's in February 2000. 2000. Um, so that so would actually have, be quite. Meaning, very recent. Meaning, very recent. I mean, of course, um, the geolo ge geologists look for hardcore physical evidence, and with the nuclear blasts, for example, that are now debated as a starting point, um, that would be, of course, something very uh, uh, hard. Uh, but I, I kind of feel we should really, perhaps there should be like a global competition for that. And you started it now, which, is really, right. which is really great. Um, there should be a global competition uh, because. Um, we should think beyond the nuclear blasts as a symbol of ourselves. And perhaps the glass beach here, waste turning into something so beautiful. Um, people now go there. Actually, it's a nature reserve now. And people now go there and pick these things. So they now talk about replenishing it, actually, with old bottles um, in a nature reserve. So that actually is a very good symbol. We've been pretty lucky there. That waste has turned into something so beautiful. Is the British Geological Society, in its considerations about the Anthropocene, is it actually considering that aspect of how old it is, or is it really that, that doesn't matter? It's whether it exists it's, or not. It's, well, there are two things. One, is it real? Does it exist? You know, mm. has the world changed? You know, from a, a state to a geological state now to one before. Um, if it has, need a boundary. Yes. And that boundary is partly <coughs> arbitrary and, and usually meant to be practical, uh, so you can find it in rocks. So it's, it, it, you, you can see something or detect something or feel something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, if we take the mid-20th century, we're really spoiled for choice. You know, yes. we, we, have, well, we have plastics, pretty well all plastics are, are, are post that time. We have that aluminium, you know, which is, was coating the US of A. Um, uh, we have a whole range of techno fossils of different sorts, biros, ballpoint pens, yes. for instance, you know, uh, which, can, you know, if you like, uh, archaeologists love these ideas because they're very tangible. They go and dig in the ground and they find very old stuff. And they can tell the very old stuff from the young stuff because of, of these physical traces that, that, that are there in the ground. You're both very recent anyway about the Anthropocene's origins. Is that yeah, I mean, it's big, that's a big change. That yeah, is the big change. Yeah, yeah. 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 And there are people who say the Anthropocene has started much earlier. Yes. Um, almost like some, I think, say, is it five, six thousand yes. years ago? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, what it really needs for something to be uh, happening on, on that scale, it, it needs to be global, um, it needs to be uh, long-term, and it needs to be measurable for, for a long, long time. So I think the effects, um, like uh, rice farming 5,000 years ago, um, had effects on the climate uh, through methane production, but very uh, small ones. Mm -hmm. And um, so in order to be a global and long-term thing and a very powerful thing, I think it needs yeah. to start um, uh, yeah. later. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you wanted to, to demonstrate, I mean, the, the, the mid-20th century, what, what is it? Then we would have to take, I think, Christian's book here uh, and take, um, put it like this. And this is time going from here to here. Um, and, and so let's say when, when um, you can see the page is just slightly bent up here. So farming started here and it spread over thousands of years from one place to another. And the world changed very, very slowly. Uh, and then um, it, it began to go up a little bit. You know, we'd have to the big here, the, the, the Industrial Revolution. But the mid 20th century, all the parameters started going up. It's a cliff. It's an environmental cliff, you know, which is why, you know, both in terms of the history and in terms of these practical markers, you know, it is turning out to be the leading candidate, you know, for that. So something around that, um, that simply works, you yeah. know, that, that we can use as, a, as you know, as, as, as a practical boundary. Well, I think you've got Glasgow off the hook there. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd love to go back yes. and check. Yes. <laughs>
I just wonder how far the Anthropocene extends, considering the fact that um, man's landed on the moon, but we've sent probes to various uh, planets and, uh, and comets, so is it restricted purely to Earth, or is it wherever mankind has touched in the solar system? <laughs> 